Today, I want to talk about the crisis that is just here on our doorsteps. Basically, everybody here, because already it has been mentioned, uh, but also all in the media, yeah, you know that there is a new influx of Rohingya refugees based on the violence that had happened in Myanmar on August 25th. And I guess that the majority of people here, if not all of you, uh, know as well that this is not the first one. This is just a new wave of Rohingya refugees coming to seek uh, safety in Bangladesh. The previous one was just one year ago, so it's not that long. But this time, I think you really need to realize that this time it is the enormity of this crisis. Like already mentioned as well, maybe the world doesn't know, but I hope that you realize that this time because of the violence, it has triggered a massive and very swift displacement of people. In this context, it is the world's largest crisis at this moment. Yeah. Based both in terms of the number of people and in terms of the speed of the crisis. So like actually your uh, prime minister said as well, this crisis is unprecedented. You see that Compared to uh, the Mediterranean, you see that it's, it's double the size. Let me put it a little bit a different way, yeah, in order to give you the enormity of this size. Just in over two months, the number of people that came in has built a city the size of Luxembourg or the size of Copenhagen, but with no infrastructure and no roads. It does look like this. It is the size of, with man-made tents of plastic sheeting and bamboo. This is Kutupalong camp at the moment. This is Balukali. These are actually pictures that were taken a little bit back. So now it is even double dense than it is now. Looking at this scale, I want to give you a couple of numbers, yeah? Because people are still crossing every time, every day, the border, and they sent this city is still growing every day. So a few shocking numbers to realize, again, how big it is. It is, at the moment, as the people reaches one million, the refugees number reaches one million, yeah, there is only one out of three persons in Ukia Teknaf are Bangladeshi. That means that for the one and a half million persons living in Ukia and Teknaf, the impact on the environment is enormous. Yeah? Other figures that you need to, that I want to show is about two out of three households have a very poor food consumption. This poor food consumption is not to do only with the quantity of food, but also with the diversity of food. This means that 100% of the uh, households living in these camps are actually uh, having negative coping strategies, meaning they skip meals, they uh, do early child marriages, or they uh, sell their possessions or their labor or their body. Other shocking number, only one out of two have access to drinking water and latrines. 50% of the children, more than the new arrivals, they are sick with diarrhea, respiratory illnesses and fever. And one out of four children of the new arrivals are actually malnourished. But yeah, I want to talk about, you see this is the complexity, you see the enormity of this crisis. However, there are so many issues that I, need, I want to discuss, but what I want to discuss now with the topic of today, rendering tomorrow, is about dignity. I was shocked when I first came back uh, to se in September to see these uh, photographs. You have all seen this one in the media as well. It was even more shocking when you go in the field. The problem is that, is this dignity? Do we render the people vulnerable like this? I want to tell you a story. We saw that the people were prepared. Some people, some organizations were prepared. It's just the massive amount of people that came. We were not prepared for that. And this resulted in a kind of crisis of people throwing clothes in, in the air throwing bags, hitting people with sticks in order to not get to food. 
What about dignity? What about their dignity? And then it became heavier. Bags of rice, bags of heavy uh, items. What about, I saw people that catch the bag and then fell down and injured their leg. Or an old woman who just received something and seconds later it was taken away from her by people that were stronger. Like this image. Also, what about the most vulnerable? Did we reach them in the beginning? Certainly not, because they were, the end, they were at the last bit to the truck when the truck was already empty. But now the weeks have passed and we have organized ourselves a bit better, but still now people are in lines. But is this dignity? I feel not. Living in this kind of makeshift camps? So when I, walked, when, when I saw with the aid worker, he told me a story about a woman. She was actually in a line for having a hot food. And she was skipping the line and going always in the back. And so he asked her and said, why are you always going to the back of the line? And she said, well, I found it difficulty being here, receiving this meal, because only a couple of days ago or weeks ago, I was at home with my uh, housekeeper making food for me. And now that same housekeeper is in the same line with me, just a little bit in front. So what about her dignity and how does she cope with this new normalcy, this changing environment. Another time as well, I saw a man walking in front and back, just not focusing, not being decided what he could do. So we walked up to him and we talked to him. And he said, well, it was difficult for him to decide what to do. He just didn't know. His glare was glazed. He was just there looking in the, in the air. So it made me wonder, if I didn't go and talk to him and set him down to have a hot meal, what would have happened? He would not have eaten anything that day. So we were all taught that we have to look at the bigger picture, not at the small details. But what if numbers are too big? What if the masses are too big and we overlook? So in that case, we need to forget the whole and we actually need, again, to focus on the individuals, like this. We had this project a little bit later on, earlier, actually, after last year's uh, crisis, with a photographer. And we talked about dignity and what it does. And that means we came up with, that are dreams. What are the dreams? What are the dreams of the small children or their parents when they were small children? Yeah, anybody here also has dreams. Maybe you dream of traveling the world, of buying a very fancy car. But we mentioned that these dreams of these people were small, very small. A child mentioned, I just dream of having three meals a day. Another child mentioned, another female mentioned, well, I just want to have my family around and have the safety. A group of uh, adults, of adolescents said, I want to be a teacher, I want to be but just here in the camp, nothing further, yeah? So how do we transform that into dignity, into something else? We also should not forget the host community, of course, because they were the first responders. And now, for instance, Balukali, who opened their land, who, hope, who welcomed the refugees, are now surrounded by a sea of these small huts. A man told me, I welcome them, they are my neighbors. However, now I have lost a lot. I have to go now three miles away to actually uh, graze my cow and make sure that she is healthy. So what about their dignity and how do they cope with that normality, with that changed environment? Yeah? And how can we then help them do that? So for me, it's all about self-reliance. The thing is that this help is a huge boost for the economy, like it or not, yeah? But how can we turn it into something that for the Bangladeshi community, for the vulnerable, also they uh, benefit from it, and not just the few businessmen and traffickers? How can we make that they also benefit from this economy? So for me, it's all about self-reliance both for the Rohingyas as well as 
the Bangladeshi very vulnerable community. With self-reliance, it, it is to enable people to make their own choices, to actually take control again of their life. It can be in very small actions, taking your children back to school. Maybe just uh, having a choice that your child is uh, asking for a candy or thing, to just buy it, to be able to buy it. Or when you have chickens, to just say, today I want to eat an egg, or I will sell it, or maybe I give it to the neighbors. Just these small things of action, yeah? But we already can start with ourselves as well. Take the time to talk, take the time to listen and see what we can do. Don't take the selfies with the uh, individual and say, oh, I gave something and, you know, that is also about dignity. So all of this makes that, for me, the, the self-reliance is very important. However, this is, needs to be a courageous decision from the government as well. And how can we, as individuals, take that forward as well? So within it, we don't have to forget again for self-reliance, actually, for the majority of people that are actually uh, living in the camps, even with the traumatic, this can be a boost. This can really work. However, we should, again, not forget the individuals within the subgroups, because there are subgroups that are too traumatized. They need more aid. They need a longer time of, of help from other people in order to become self-reliant. However, like I said, the message that I really want to give is that self-reliance gives back or restores the hope, the dreams, and the dignity of not only Rohingya, but also the very vulnerable Bangladeshi community who lives amongst them. And therefore, it renders the people's tomorrow. Thank you.